Roughing It by Mark Twain Chapter 12 Just beyond the breakfast station, we overtook a Mormon emigrant train of 33 wagons, and tramping warily along and driving their herd of loose cows were dozens of coarse-clad and sad-looking men, women, and children who had walked as they were walking now, day after day for eight lingering weeks, and in that time had compassed the distance our stage had come in eight days and three hours, 798 miles. They were dusty and uncombed, hatless, bonnetless, and ragged, and they did look so tired. After breakfast, we bathed in Horse Creek, a previously limpid, sparkling stream, and appreciated luxury, for it was very seldom that our furious coach halted long enough for an indulgence of that kind. We changed horses ten or twelve times in every twenty-four hours, changed mules, rather, six mules, and did it nearly every time in four minutes. It was lively work. As our coach rattled up to each station, six harnessed mules stepped gaily from the stable, and in the twinkling of an eye almost, the old team was out and the new one in, and we off and away again. During the afternoon, we passed Sweetwater Creek, Independence Rock, Devil's Gate, and the Devil's Gap. The latter were wild specimens of rugged scenery and full of interest. We were in the heart of the Rocky Mountains now, and we also passed by an alkali or soda lake, and we woke up to the fact that our journey had stretched a long way across the world when the driver said that the Mormons often came there from Great Salt Lake City to haul away Celeratus. He said that a few days gone by, they had shoveled up enough pure saleratus from the ground. It was a dry lake to load two wagons, and that when they got these two wagons loads of a drug that cost them nothing to Salt Lake, they could sell it for 25 cents a pound. In the night, we sailed by a most notable curiosity, and one we had been hearing a good deal about for a day or two, and were suffering to see. This was what might be called a natural ice house. It was August now, and sweltering weather in the daytime. Yet at one of the stations, the men could scape, scrape the soil on the hillside under the lee of a range of boulders, and at a depth of six inches cut out pure blocks of ice, hard, compactly frozen, and clear as crystal. Toward dawn we got under way again, and presently, as we sat with raised curtains, enjoying our early morning smoke and contemplating the first splendor of the rising sun as it swept down the long array of mountain peaks, flushing and gilding crag after crag and summit after summit, as if the invisible creator reviewed his gray veterans and they saluted with a smile, we hove in sight of South Pass City. The hotel keeper, the postmaster, the blacksmith, the mayor, the constable, the city marshal, and the principal citizen and property holder all came out and greeted us cheerily and we gave him good day. He gave us a little Indian news and a little Rocky Mountain news, and we gave him some Plains information in return. He then retired to his lonely grandeur, and we climbed on up among the bristling peaks and the ragged clouds. South Pass City consisted of four log cabins, one of which was unfinished, and the gentleman with all those offices and titles was the chiefest of the ten citizens of the place. Think of hotel keeper, postmaster, blacksmith, mayor, constable, city marshal, and principal citizen, all condensed into one person and 
crammed into one skin. Bemis said he was a perfect Allen's revolver of dignities. And he said that if he were to die as postmaster or as blacksmith, or as postmaster and blacksmith both, the people might stand it. But if he were to die all over, it would be a frightful loss to the community. Two miles beyond South Pass City, we saw for the first time that mysterious marvel which all western untraveled boys have heard of and fully believe in, but are sure to be astounded at when they see it with their own eyes, nevertheless. Banks of snow in dead summertime. We were now far up toward the sky, and knew all the time that we must presently encounter lofty summits clad in the eternal snow, which was so commonplace a matter of mention in books. And yet when I did see it glittering in the sun on stately domes in the distance and knew the month was August, and that my coat was hanging up because it was too warm to wear it, I was full as much amazed as if I never had heard of snow in August before. Truly, seeing is believing. And many a man lives a long life through thinking he believes certain universally received and well-established things, and yet never suspects that if he were confronted by those things once, he would discover that he did not really believe them before, but only thought he believed them. In a little while, quite a number of peaks swung into view with long claws of glittering snow clasping them, and with here and there in the shade down the mountainside a little solitary patch of snow looking no larger than a lady's pocket handkerchief, but being in reality as large as a public square. And now, at last, we were fairly in the renowned South Pass, and whirling gaily along high above the common world. We were perched upon the extreme summit of the great range of the Rocky Mountains, toward which we had been climbing, patiently climbing, ceaselessly climbing for days and nights together. And about us was gathered a convention of nature's kings that stood ten, twelve, and even thirteen thousand feet high. Grand old fellows who would have to stoop to see Mount Washington in the twilight. We were in such an airy elevation above the creeping populations of the earth that now and then when the obstructing crag stood out of the way it seemed that we could look around and abroad and contemplate the whole great globe with its dissolving views of mountains, seas, and continents stretching away through the mystery of the summer haze. As a general thing, the pass was more suggestive of a valley than a suspension bridge in the clouds, but it strongly suggested the latter at one spot. At that place, the upper third of one or two majestic purple domes projected above our level on either hand and gave us a sense of a hidden great deep of mountains and plains and valleys down about their bases, which we fancied we might see if we could step to the edge and look over. These sultans of the fastnesses were turbaned with tumbled volumes of cloud, which shredded away from time to time and drifted off fringed and torn, trailing their continents of shadow after them. And catching presently on an intercepting peak, wrapped it about and brooded there, then shredded away again and left the purple peak as they had left the purple domes, downy and white with new-laid snow. In passing, these monstrous rags of cloud hung low and swept along right over the spectator's head, swinging that tatter so nearly in his face that his impulse was to shrink when they came close. In the one place I speak of, one could look below him upon a world of diminishing crags and canyons leading down, down, and away to a vague plain with a thread in it which was a road. 
and bunches of feathers in it, which were trees. A pretty picture sleeping in the sunlight. But with the darkness stealing over it and glooming its features deeper and deeper under the frown of a coming storm. And then, while no film or shadow marred the noon brightness of his high perch, he could watch the tempest break forth down there and see the lightnings leap from crag to crag and the sheeted rain drive along the canyon sides and hear the thunders peal and crash and roar. We had this spectacle, a familiar one to many, but to us a novelty. We bowled along cheerily, and presently at the very summit, though it had been all summit to us and all equally level for half an hour or more, we came to a spring which spent its water through two outlets and sent it in opposite directions. The conductor said that one of those streams which we were looking at was just starting on a journey westward to the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean, through hundreds and even thousands of miles of desert solitudes. He said that the other was just leaving its home among the snow peaks on a similar journey eastward. And we knew that long after we should have forgotten the simple rivulet, it would still be plodding its patient way down the mountainsides and canyon beds and between the banks of the Yellowstone. And by and by would join the broad Missouri and flow through unknown plains and deserts and unvisited wilderness. And at a long and troubled pilgrimage among snags and wrecks and sandbars and enter the Mississippi, touch the wharves of St. Louis and still drift on, traversing shoals and rocky channels, then endless chains of bottomless and ample bends swalled with unbroken forests, then mysterious byways and secret passages among woody islands, then the chain bends again, bordered with wide levels of shining sugar cane in place of the somber forests. Then by New Orleans and still other chains of bends, and finally, after two long months of daily and nightly harassment, excitement, enjoyment, adventure, and awful peril of parched throats, pumps, and evaporation, pass the gulf and enter into its rest upon the bosom of the tropic sea never to look upon its snow peaks again or regret them. I freighted a leaf with the mental message for the friends at home and dropped it in the stream. But I put no stamp on it and it was held for postage somewhere. On the summit we overtook an emigrant train of many wagons, many tired men and women, and many a disgusted sheep and cow. In the woefully dusty horseman in charge of the expedition, I recognized John. Of all persons in the world to meet on top of the Rocky Mountains, thousands of miles from home, he was the last one I should have looked for. We were schoolboys together and warm friends for years. But a boyish prank of mine had disrupted this friendship, and it had never been renewed. The act of which I speak was this. I had been accustomed to visit occasionally an editor whose room was in the third story of a building that overlooked the street. One day this editor gave me a watermelon which I made preparations to devour on the spot, but chancing to look out of the window I saw John standing directly under it, and an irresistible desire came upon me to drop the melon on his head, which I immediately did. I was the loser, for it spoiled the melon, and John never forgave me, and we dropped all intercourse and parted, but now met again under these circumstances. We recognized each other simultaneously, and hands were grasped as warmly as if no coldness had ever existed between us, and no allusion was made to any. All animosities were buried in the simple fact of meeting a familiar face in that isolated spot so far from home, 
was sufficient to make us forget all things but pleasant ones, and we parted again with sincere goodbye and God bless you from both. We had been climbing up the long shoulders of the Rocky Mountains for many tedious hours. We started down them now, and we went spinning away at a round rate, too. We left the snowy Wind River Mountains and Winter Mountains behind and sped away, always through splendid scenery, but occasionally through long ranks of white skeletons of mules and oxen, monuments of the huge emigration of other days. And here and there were upended boards or small piles of stones, which the driver said marked the resting place of more precious remains. It was the loneliest land for a grave, a land given over to the coyote and the raven, which is but another name for desolation and utter solitude. On damp, murky nights, these scattered skeletons gave forth a soft, hideous glow, like very faint spots of moonlight starring the vague desert. It was because of the phosphorus in the bones. But no scientific explanation could keep a body from shivering when he drifted by one of those ghostly lights and knew that a skull held it. At midnight it began to rain, and I never saw anything like it. Indeed, I did not even see this, for it was too dark. We fastened down the curtains and even caulked them with clothing, but the rain streamed in in twenty places notwithstanding. There was no escape. If one moved his feet out of a stream, he brought his body under one, and if he moved his body, he got one somewhere else. If he struggled out of the drenched blankets and sat up, he was bound to get one down the back of his neck. Meantime, the stage was wandering about a plain with gaping gullies in it, for the driver could not see an inch before his face, nor keep the road. And the storm pelted so pitilessly that there was no keeping the horses still. With the first abatement, the conductor turned out with lanterns to look for the road, and the first dash he made was into a chasm about fourteen feet deep, his lantern following like a meteor. As soon as he touched bottom, he sang out frantically, Don't come here! To which the driver, who was looking over the precipice where he had disappeared, replied with an injured air, Think I'm a damn fool? The conductor was more than an hour finding the road, a matter which showed us how far we had wandered and what chances we had been taking. He traced our wheel tracks to the imminent verge of danger in two places. I have always been glad that we were not killed that night. I do not know any particular reason, but I have always been glad. In the morning, the tenth day out, we crossed Green River, a fine, large, limpid stream, stuck in it with the water just up to the top of our mail bed and waited till extra teams were put on to haul us up the steep bank. But it was nice cool water, and besides, it could not find any fresh place on us to wet. At the Green River Station we had breakfast. Hot biscuits, fresh antelope steaks, and coffee. The only decent meal we tasted between the United States and Great Salt Lake City, and the only one we were ever really thankful for. Think of the monotonous execrableness of the thirty that went before it. To leave this one simple breakfast looming up in my memory like a shot tower after all these years have gone by. At 5 p.m. we reached Fort Bridger, 117 miles from the South Pass and 1,025 miles from St. Joseph. 52 miles further on, near the head of Echo Canyon, we met 60 United States soldiers from Camp Floyd. The day before, they had fired upon 300 or 400 Indians, whom they supposed gathered together for no good purpose. 
In the fight that had ensued, four Indians were captured and the main body chased four miles, but nobody killed. This looked like business. We had a notion to get out and join the sixty soldiers, but upon reflecting that there were four hundred of the Indians, we concluded to go on and join the Indians. Echo Canyon is twenty miles long. It was like a long, smooth, narrow street with a gradual descending grade and shut in by enormous perpendicular walls of coarse conglomerate, four hundred feet high in many places and turreted like medieval castles. This was the most faultless piece of road in the mountains, and the driver said he would let his team out. He did. And if the Pacific Express trains whizzed through there now any faster than we did then in the stagecoach, I envy the passengers the exhilaration of it. We fairly seemed to pick up our wheels and fly, and the mail matter was lifted up free from everything and held in solution. I'm not given to exaggeration, and when I say a thing, I mean it. However, time presses. At four in the afternoon, we arrived on the summit of Big Mountain, fifteen miles from Salt Lake City, when all the world was glorified with the setting sun and the most stupendous panorama of mountain peaks yet encountered burst on our sight. We looked out upon this sublime spectacle from under the arch of a brilliant rainbow. Even the overland stage driver stopped his horses and gazed. Half an hour or an hour later, we changed horses and took supper with the Mormon Destroying Angel. Destroying Angels, as I understand it, are Latter-day Saints who are set apart by the church to conduct permanent disappearances of obnoxious citizens. I had heard a deal about these Mormon-destroying angels and the dark and bloody deeds they had done, and when I entered this one's house I had my shudder all ready. But alas, for all our romances, he was nothing but a loud, profane, offensive old blackguard. He was murderous enough, possibly, to fill the bill of a destroyer, but would you have any kind of an angel devoid of dignity? Could you abide an angel in an unclean shirt and no suspenders? Could you respect an angel with a hoarse laugh and a swagger like a buccaneer? There were other black guards present, comrades of this one, and there was one person that looked like a gentleman, Heber C. Kimball's son, tall and well-made and thirty years old, perhaps. A lot of slatternly women flitted hither and thither in a hurry with coffee pots, plates of bread, and other appurtenances to supper, and these were said to be the wives of the angel, or some of them at least, and of course they were, for if they had been hired help, they would not have let an angel from above storm and swear at them as he did, let alone one from the place this one hailed from. This was our first experience of the Western peculiar institution, and it was not very prepossessing. We did not tarry long to observe it, but hurried on to the home of the Latter-day Saints, the stronghold of the prophets, the capital of the only absolute monarch in America, Great Salt Lake City. As the night closed in, we took sanctuary in the Salt Lake House and unpacked our baggage.